गुड मॉर्निंग गाइस आई एम सृष्टि एंड आई एम गोइंग टू स्टार्ट विद अनदर सेट ऑफ फाइव फाइनेंस एम सी क्यूज विद यू टूडे द टॉपिक दैट वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस टूडे इज सम रिलेटेड टू द करेंट अफेयर्स एंड स्टैटिक फाइनेंस क्वेश्चन ऑल्सो एंड वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस सम फाइनेंशियल कॉन्सेप्ट ऑल्सो सो डू पे दी अटेंशन टिल द एंड ऑफ द वीडियो सो दैट यू कुड हैव अ बेसिक अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ ईच कॉन्सेप्ट that i am going to discuss today with you if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet then what are you waiting for do subscribe to our channel for more regular updates let's start with the first question for today the question says what is the interest rate of employee provident fund for the year 2018 19 so out of these four options you have to choose the one option about the interest rate of epf for the year 2018 19 so do pay the attention for the year 2018 19 you must know the interest rate of epf so before answering the question let's have some deep insight into what epf is and what is the interest rate epf is the main scheme under the employees provident funds and miscellaneous provisions act 1952 further it covers every establishment in which 20 or more persons are employed and certain organizations are covered subject to certain conditions and exemptions even if they employ less than 20 persons so do notice that only the organizations which have more than 20 employees they have to mandatorily come under this epfo whereas the organizations having less than 20 people then subject to certain conditions and exemptions they may also come then we have under this epf scheme an employee has to pay a certain contribution towards the scheme and an equal contribution is made by the employer so you must have seen that when you work in an organization then your employer also pays towards your epf and you also pay the same amount as your employer is paying towards your epf so those organizations follow the epf scheme further we are going to discuss the difference between epf and ppf also but first let us complete the discussion on epf so as per the rules employees who pay is more than 15000 per month at the time of joining they are not eligible and they are called non eligible employee employees drawing less than 15000 per month have to mandatorily become the members of epf now you must be wondering that in the organizations where you work even though your pay is more than 15000 then how this epf scheme is working so in such case an employee who is drawing the pay above the prescribed limit that is 15000 per month they can become a member with the permission of the assistant pf commissioner if he and his employer agree but in such organizations also it is told that epf is mandatory now we have as we have already discussed that the contribution made by the employer and the employee so the contribution paid by the employer is 12% of the basic pay plus dearness allowance plus retaining allowance now this is the minimum thing that you have to contribute towards epf but the employee can voluntarily pay higher contribution above the statutory rate of 12% of the basic pay and this is called contribution towards voluntarily provident fund now i hope that you have understood the concept of epf now let's discuss what ppf is and how is it different from epf so epf as we have already discussed it is a deduction from the salaries of the individuals by company with more than 20 employees whereas ppf is not related to employer rather it is a government scheme that is public provident fund and it can be opened by resident indian individuals either salaried or non salaried individuals and it cannot be opened by huf so huf are restricted to open ppf i hope that you have understood the difference between epf and ppf now let's move back to the question to answer it so the answer to this question is 8.65% in 2017 18 it was 8.55% 
in 2016-17 it was 8.65 percent and again in 2018-19 it is 8.65 percent so now let's move to the next question for today. What is the main motive behind the introduction of 59 minute scheme in November 2018 by public sector banks in India? So you have to tell me the main motive behind the introduction of 59 minutes and not the expanded versions motive. If you're not getting me right now, so let's move on to the next slide so that I can tell you that what is the main motive and what is the motives after the expansion of this scheme. So it is an online marketplace to cater to various financial aspirations. So public sector banks have made a web portal of 59 minute scheme wherein you will get the loan approved within 59 minutes that is within one hour. So initially basic aim of this scheme was to improve the credit access for MSMEs but that was up to 1 crore sanction of the loan. Now this scheme has been widened and the benefits of this platform which was made available to MSMEs earlier, now that will be available to everyone in the form of home and personal loan. So what is the benefit of this scheme? Now the customers will get multiple options to choose a bank with suitable offering at the completion of digital journey. This will provide the loan aspirants quick and hassle free access to home and personal loan whether or not they have banking and financial relationship with available list of banks. Now as I have told you that for MSMEs it was up to 1 crore rupees but 5 banks who have extended this in principle approval of loans up to 5 crore from the earlier 1 crore are SBI, Union Bank, Andhra Bank, Corporation Bank and Oriental Bank of Commerce. Also I would like to discuss it with you that personal loan in principle approvals are currently provided for a value up to rupees 15 lakhs only and home loan in principle approvals are currently provided for value up to 10 crore and the rate of interest starts from 8.5 percent onwards. Now let's move back to the question to answer it and I hope that the additional information that I have given you, you could retain it so as to answer the questions that could come from this part. So the question was asking you the main motive behind this scheme, the initial motive and as we have discussed, the initial motive of this scheme was to have a ease of credit access for MSME sector. So the option D is the correct answer over here. Now the next question for today is Financial Benchmarks India Private Limited has been jointly formed as an independent company for administration of benchmarks in financial markets. Which of the following is not an organization who jointly created FBIL? So before answering this question, let's have some discussion on this topic in the next slide. So FBIL is jointly owned by these organizations that is Fixed Income Money Market and Derivative Association of India, Foreign Exchange Dealers Association of India and Indian Banks Association. And it was formed in December 2014 as a private limited company under the Company Act 2013. So what is the aim of FBIL here? It aim to develop and administer benchmarks related to the money market, government securities and foreign exchanges in India. So it is committed to provide the financial benchmarks that are free from bias, backed by robust data driven research and compliant with the global best practices. So recently in news also, when there was a shift from MCLR to the external benchmark rate, the rates which could be formed as the base, they have to be published by FBIL as we have already seen there. So if we talk about the history or the background of FBIL, then the Reserve Bank of India set up a committee on financial benchmarks in June 2013 to review the existing systems governing major financial benchmarks in India. And that committee was headed by 
Vijay Bhaskar, the then executive director of Reserve Bank of India. And he made a wide ranging recommendation to reform the benchmark administration in India. These were accepted by RBI in the early 2014, and it was suggested that these associations, which we have discussed, they may jointly or independently form a separate entity to administer the benchmarks. So it is the first major step for formation of FBIL as an independent benchmark administrator for interest rates and foreign exchange. And then finally, it was formed in December 2014. Now let's move back to the question to answer it. So as we know and as we have discussed that fixed income money market and derivative association of India Foreign Exchange Dealers Association of India and Indian Banks Association, they directly and jointly owns Financial Benchmarks India Private Limited. So uh, the answer to this question is Securities and Exchange Board of India because it is not an organization who jointly created FBIL. Now let's move on to the next question for today. In an inflationary trend, the pricing of the bank products indicates which of the following? Now you have to use your analytical mind to answer this question now. So let's discuss it. So as an individual, if you see that in the coming period inflation is rising, then what would you do? You will obviously prefer to consume today rather than keeping your money in the banks. You will buy a 10 rupee worth good of now to avoid purchasing this same good for 20 rupees in the future. And these are arbitrary numbers, so don't think that hyperinflation is there. It's just an example to make you understand this. So this is an inflationary trend. So you will obviously buy today, consume today. In return, what banks will do? As you are not investing in the banks, banks will increase their interest rates to attract you for keeping your money in the banks. So we have got our answer from this first proposition. Now let's understand it in another way. Also, when the banks increase their interest rates, fewer people want to borrow money because it costs more to do so while that money accrues at a higher interest. So earlier what was happening, you were also borrowing money and that was making inflation even more higher. So in order to curb the inflation, banks will increase their interest rates so to bring the inflation down as borrowings will reduce and that will reduce the money supply in the economy and therefore inflation will reduce. So the answer to this question is that the pricing of bank products will also have an increasing trend because the banks will increase their interest rates. I hope that you have got this concept clearly in your minds because this is one of the very basic and important concept in finance related to interest rates and inflation. Now let's move on to the next and the last question for today. Which of the following appearing in the balance sheet generates tax advantage and hence affects the capital structure decision? So four options are given reserve and surplus, long term debt, preference share capital and equity share capital. Out of these four options, you have to tell me that which of the following which appears in the balance sheet will generate the tax advantage for you in the capital structure decisions. Now let's see that while calculating EPS, you come up with the EBIT or the operating profit that is earning before interest and tax. Then you deduct the interest rate that is the fixed interest rates on the bonds or the debts that you take. Then after that, you are left with EBT that is earnings before tax and after that you deduct your tax. So higher the interest rate, lower would be the tax because EBT will reduce from the same amount as of interest and that is why long term debts on which fixed interest rate charges are there, they provide you with the tax advantage. Now let's discuss some more important points on this long term debt in the next slide. Now as we have already seen that interest is tax deduct after tax cost of debt is a function of tax rate. 
then another point is that though it provides you the advantage of tax advantage but it is also associated with a major drawback that is the default risk of the firm increases because it is fixed charges it is the charge against the profit even though a firm is having money or not it has to pay the interest rates on the bonds or the debentures that it takes and if any firm defaults on the interest payments then we can see from the past examples that what happened to those companies there arises a default risk on those companies the next is trading on equity so the major and a main motive of any organization is to maximize the return of equity shareholders that is eps so in order to maximize the return of equity shareholders a firm tries to use debentures or bonds as part of its capital structure because that the interest is tax deductible but it has to balance it the firm after taking the debts and bonds on one side and on another side it has to take care of the equity shareholders so it has to balance it and that is known as trading on equity it has to keep in mind the advantages and disadvantages of using debts and bonds and it has to keep in mind its main objective of equity shareholders so with this we have discussed the major concepts related to the long term debt and its advantages disadvantages and i hope that you have understood all the concepts as i have told you further i am hoping that you enjoyed this session so this is all for today do subscribe to our channel for regular updates of finance current affair videos thank you for watching the video